all Scripture is useful, what's the purpose of historical books and genealogies? How many people have asked that question to themselves? Genealogies. Don't they turn a lot of people off? You open up the Bible and you start reading in Genesis 1 and it's beautiful, isn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's the beautiful creation story. There's the fall of man. And then you get to Genesis 5. Oh, a genealogy. Well, you weather through that and you read 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Everything's wonderful because we have Noah and the flood. And then we get to another genealogy. Oh. So we start in Matthew, don't we? We just open up, I'm just going to start New Testament. First 18 verses, genealogy. So guess what we do? We just skip it. Don't we? Can't say those names anyway. And there's a lot of individuals, folks, who don't like the books of history and stuff in the Old Testament. You know that? They find it dull and dry and boring and not applicable and not really needed. Why are we studying that Old Testament stuff? We're under the New Testament today. Folks just get bad attitudes toward those things. So here's a person asking a question. If all Scripture is useful, if all Scripture is profitable, why do we need these for us to read. Well, Romans 15, 4 gives a summary answer, doesn't it? Paul says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. I might give you this answer. Why do we want to learn the genealogies? Why do we want to read those old historical books? Because God wants you to learn. We're done. Let's go home. That's kind of crude, isn't it? Let's talk about the historical narratives for just a minute. Why do we need to read this historical narratives? Number one, they're foundational, aren't they? There's been a statement that's been made since I can remember being in the church, and it's this. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So as I'm reading through the Old Testament, what I'm really reading about is the New Testament, aren't I? But it's just concealed in there. And when I read the New Testament, now I see all the things that I need to understand about the Old Testament. You see, if I didn't have the Old, the New wouldn't make sense. And if all I had was the New... I wouldn't understand it because I didn't have the old. It's foundational. Number two, I don't know about you, but some of those stories in the Old Testament are pretty entertaining. We studied 1 Samuel and that was pretty exciting to me. That needs to be a movie. Saul becomes king. He just gets a dislike for David because he whoops up on a giant and then he chases after him for a long, long period of time. I don't know about you, that's pretty exciting stuff for me. This morning's lesson that we talked about with David and Bathsheba. Folks, that's pretty interesting stuff. It's entertaining. Number three, it's interpretive. Aren't you glad we have the Old Testament? How could you understand the book of Hebrews if we did not have the Old Testament? You couldn't do it. You wouldn't know what in the world's going on. So sometimes our Old Testament helps us to interpret the things in the New Testament. Number four, those historical narratives are instructive, aren't they? They teach us about faith. They teach us about obedience. They teach us about courage. Like such men as Noah and Abraham and Moses. We need to understand what it means to obey God and to see people doing what God tells them to do because we're supposed to do that. Next, they're inspirational, aren't they? I love to read about Joseph and how years and years and years after his brothers had sinned against him, 
Their father dies and what does he do? He forgives them, doesn't he? They're scared that he's going to do something horrible to them. Put them to death, put them in prison, whatever. And yet, what does Joseph do? Joseph forgives his brothers after 20 plus long years of being away from them. The power of prayer. Here Hannah is. A woman who cannot bear children. And she goes to God and she makes a very specific quest. Give me a man-child. And she gets a man-child by the name of Samuel. Fortitude. Like men like Daniel. Standing before foreign kings. And who refuse to bow to the will of those kings. And are thrown into... A den of lions, and yet they are taken care of by God. You see, we've got to stand regardless, don't we? You see, those kind of examples of the Old Testament inspire us to be better individuals ourselves. And then lastly, the Old Testament is cautionary, isn't it? What if we were reading through the New Testament? Jesus makes this statement in Luke's Gospel. And He says, remember Lot's wife. And we don't have an Old Testament. You know what we would say? Who's Lot's wife? What would she do? What am I supposed to remember? But Jesus states three little words. Remember Lot's wife. And guess what? I have a ton of lessons that I immediately bring to mind, don't I? Sodom and Gomorrah. God's judgment upon a wicked city. God's willingness to save righteous people. And yet there's a love in this woman's heart for that city and she turns and rebels against God and God sends forth His judgment on her because of her disobedience. You see, if I disobey God, there's judgment God will bring upon me. You see, the Old Testament has some cautionary tales that you and I need to learn from, don't they? So now let's ask this question. Yeah, but Vic, what about them old genealogies? Ugh. Let me make three points about genealogies. There's probably more that we can make mention of. I know there are. Number one, messianic confirmation. That's one of the reasons that they're there, folks. The Messiah was supposed to come from the lineage of Abraham, Jesse, and David. Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 3. Jesse, the father of David, Isaiah 11, verse 1. And then through David, we just studied that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. So I have to have proof if Jesus is the Messiah that He came from that lineage. Well, guess what? Matthew 1 reveals all three of those men in the lineage of Jesus. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of who? Abraham. He fulfills two of them in the very first verse, doesn't he? It doesn't in and of itself prove that Jesus is the Messiah, but the prophecies are there. He had to fulfill them. He had to be from that lineage. And guess what? Jesus was. So Jesus starts on a good foot, doesn't he? As far as his lineage is concerned, So we have messianic confirmation found in the genealogies. But secondly, sometimes the genealogies establish truth. When you go to the book of Jude and you get down to verse 14, Jude talks about an Old Testament character by the name of Enoch. We know Enoch, don't we? Do you know he was a prophet? And he prophesied of things that was going to happen in the New Testament even. But in that verse... Jude says this, Enoch was the seventh from Adam. Are the genealogies of the Old Testament accurate? Can we trust them? Well, we go back to Genesis 5, a genealogy. And folks, watch what we have. Adam, one. Seth, two. Enos, three. Cainan, Four, Mahalalel, five, Jared, six, Enoch, seven. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. 
That genealogy in Genesis 5 is just as accurate as it can be. It is proved to be accurate. And the statement that Jude made is accurate, is it not? And so if what Jude is writing about is accurate in verse 14, then guess what? The entirety of the narrative is accurate, isn't it? Everything that he has to say is accurate. And I find it interesting that he talks about Satan arguing about the body of Moses in that text, doesn't he? You see, if I can trust him in one verse, I can trust him in the entirety of the epistle. And then the third point, providence of God. Sometimes in those genealogies, you see the providence of God. Let's take Matthew 1 for our example. Abraham begat Isaac. That's what the text says. Any providence in that? Let me tell you what, there's a ton of providence, wasn't there? Abraham couldn't have children. His wife couldn't have children. And yet God said, you're going to have children. And they did. One hundred years old the man was. His wife is 99 and she bears children. Unbelievable. Why? Because of the providence of God. Notice this statement. Judas begat Pharaoh's and Zerah of Thamer. That's no, that's no, the last word there is really Tamar of the Old Testament. Who's Tamar? Tamar is the daughter-in-law of Judah. She tricks her father-in-law into having a sexual relationship with her, posing as a prostitute. And she bears a child by the name of Pharaoh's. And guess what? Pharaoh's is in the Messianic lineage. That seems kind of weird, doesn't it? The providence of God. How about this one? Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Is there any providence in that? Ruth's a what? A Moabite. And yet all of a sudden we find in the lineage of Jesus this Moabite woman giving birth to a son through whom will come the Christ, the providence of God. Now watch this one. David the king begat who? Solomon. Of her that had been the wife of who? Urias. Oh me, that's what we're talking about in our lessons right now, isn't it? I want you to think about that. David sins with Bathsheba, has her husband murdered, marries Bathsheba, has a son named Solomon, and Jesus comes from him. You can talk to God about that one. But you see how God works His providence even through terrible events? Now watch this one. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Folks, that verse acknowledges a miracle, doesn't it? You see, we don't have the normal genealogy. It doesn't say that Jacob begat Joseph and Joseph begat Jesus because that didn't happen. Joseph was what? The husband of Mary, of whom was born Christ. He didn't have a sexual relationship with her. That woman was pregnant by means of virgin birth and brought the Christ into the world. You see, when we read those genealogies carefully and we pay attention to the lessons, sometimes we see the providence of God at work in those genealogies. That's just three reasons that we have the genealogies, folks. Number one, messianic confirmation. Number two, to establish truth. And number three, to manifest the providence of God to us as mankind.